Paul, this is the fifth FQXI uh, conference on fundamental questions. Uh, you've been at all five. I've been at only four. This time we're talking about the physics of the observers. Mm -hmm. uh, what are observers? You know, I'm talking to some of your colleagues here, and everybody seems to have a very deflationary approach to observers. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I was amused that uh, one of the participants here, Suzanne, still put up a slide saying, I observe, therefore I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the subject of observation normally is uh, screened off in discussions of physics. Uh, physicists feel uncomfortable talking about anything to do with the mind, and even something as innocuous as a measurement mm. uh, creates some sense of unease. And so the first thing is very bold of the organizers to say, well, let's confront this head on. We can't dodge the existence of observers or observations because it's part of the world that we observe. Now, the observer is part of the observed world. And if physics pretends to explain everything about existence, it's got to somehow incorporate observers in that. Um, but having made that statement, of course, there are many different layers at which one can get at this. And the simplest layer that I think doesn't ruff, ruffle too many feathers is to say, well, an observer is a system that has internal states that can process information from the world around about and then uh, act on that information. That is, uh, the behavior of that system uh, will be modified according to these internal states. Uh, and for me, the critical thing that I would add to that is these internal states have to include a representation of the observer itself. So it's not sufficient that we observe the world and act on it, but I think uh, we, we have to get to, uh, have to recognize that, the, that an observer has a model uh, of, re of reality, including that's the observer a itself. Big difference. Yes, but that self referential aspect. Uh, yes. Because some would say the observer is just, a, uh, just an interaction of some kind, and two billiard balls could be observers if they just collide because they're exchanging right. information. Don't call that an observation. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's essential that you have that internal representation of the of the self, if you like, the, of the observer. So let's just get the landscape. When we use the observer in a, in a classical macroscopic sense, we sort of have an intuition of what it means to observe. But then there's an observer in quantum mechanics, an observer in cosmology, general relativity. So this English word observer that you're defining that needs an internal state that has a representation of itself, is that? Yes. And so that's a very powerful yes, definition. Yes, so probably going beyond what a lot of my colleagues would yeah, want to uh, do. But I think it's, it's essential uh, if science pretends to explain everything about the world. Because I do have a sense of self. And you might say, as some people often do, oh, that's just an illusion. Selves don't exist. Uh, we just um, hallucinate our own existence. Uh, and I'm always amused when I hear that because uh, what is an, illu an illusion or a hallucination? It's um, uh, an impression <laughs> created by the brain. And so that's simply saying, well, the self is created by the brain. Well, sure, what else do you suppose it's created by? <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course it's created <laughs> by the brain. Um, uh, and so I don't think uh, the, the statement, the self is an illusion, uh, has any content. Uh, so the observer in each of these contexts, uh, particularly in quantum mechanics and uh, in cosmology, is, is that the same kind of observer? Uh, or, or, or are they different kinds of things that are expressed by the same English word? Well, they clearly are different kinds of things. Of course, they may merge in one entity when we figure all this out. Mm -hmm. uh, but. The act of observation in cosmology is simply the statement that the universe that we see from our particular vantage point may not be typical of the whole. Uh, so for example, uh, if almost all of the universe were hostile to life, uh, obviously we wouldn't be observing such a region. Uh, we're in a, a life encouraging region. That's no surprise. It's just a very straightforward statement. Uh, but we, we cannot be sure that the whole of the universe would in fact support life. Uh, and if we want to enlarge our view beyond the distance that we can see with our most powerful instruments uh, and that very much bigger picture, then it seems almost inevitable that in that larger picture there will be huge regions which do not support life. Um, so it becomes a sort of vantage point, nothing more than that. 
that, it, that there's no discussion about what goes on in the in, in the mind or the brain of, of the observer. It's simply a geographical location. Uh, but now, when it comes to quantum mechanics, it's a much tougher proposition because there, uh, the the quantum world describes a multiplicity of reali realities, a sort of shadowy, ghostly amalgam of different possibilities. And yet, in daily life, uh, we uh, seem to see a single concrete reality. And the transition from this superposition of uh, different possibilities to a single actuality is the notorious measurement or observer problem of quantum mechanics. And there, there seems to be something much more profound going on, because it's not just um, a perspective on the world, as you have to do in cosmology. It's really more something about the nature of the mm -hmm. world itself that is uh, changing as an act of observation. And that's still a tough one. You've, uh, as opposed to many of your colleagues, give more credence to this inner representational state or consciousness, to use a more general term, in terms of understanding not just uh, uh, our uh, accidental physical makeup as human beings, but the universe itself. Um, but if you go back to the early uh, universe, there obviously weren't any conscious beings around. So does that obviate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the conjecture that consciousness <laughs> is fundamentally important? Uh, I, I certainly think that uh, the emergence of conscious beings at some stage in the universe is fundamental to the actual workings of the universe. It's not an incidental, quirky, little optional extra, an aberration uh, stumbled of along uh, the way. It's something that's built into the very nature of the universe. But as you correctly point out, there were no observers one second after the Big Bang, as far as we know. Uh, and so uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, can you make a statement that mind, if you like, to be provocative, uh, is fundamental to the universe if mind hasn't always existed in the universe? Well, um, there's uh, a, a simple answer and a more subtle answer to that. The, the simple answer is, well, something can be fundamental but not always be there. I'll give you a, a straightforward example of that. Uh, so uh, particular fundamental particles, say um, uh, the electron, uh, probably didn't exist during the first split second mm. of the universe. Mm. Uh, the inflationary phase, it was basically a vacuum. Uh, these things came into existence, but I, I think few physicists would... Uh, claim that the electrons are not fundamental because they haven't always been around. And that's true of, of, of many physical things that we do regard as fundamental. So that's a sort of simple explanation. But there's a more subtle one. And that is, uh, in quantum physics, the relationship uh, between events uh, across time is rather different from what it is in sort of daily life and, and common sense. Uh, and that's because uh, the acts of observation today uh, can not only affect what's going to happen in the future, uh, but in some sense constrains what happens in the past. Uh, and this is a, a subtle point. Uh, Einstein never liked quantum mechanics. He talked about ghostly action at a distance. And what he meant by that was that uh, you can set up a quantum system. So uh, what happens here and what happens there are interconnected, uh, not in a way that means you can signal from this place to that place, but in a way that when you uh, compare what's observed here and what's observed there and sit down afterwards and put the records together, they're linked in a manner that makes no sense in uh, just sort of everyday view of reality of things really existing prior to them being observed. Now, it's a very simple matter to say that two systems which are separated in space uh, and observed at the same time, they uh, go to a different frame of reference, and that means that uh, one is observed before the other. And so this uh, linkage, this ghostly action at, this, at a distance, uh, can operate backward in time as well. And this was spotted by John Wheeler, uh, the great uh, theoretical physicist who uh, devised a, a thought experiment called the delayed choice experiment, uh, in which he some sort of uh, contrivance, we don't need to go into the technical details, but the upshot being um, that uh, the, uh, the observer could choose uh, whether to make one type of measurement or another, and which choice the, uh, the observer or the experimenter made would affect the nature of reality at the other end in the past. Uh, and so uh, 
a, a simple lab setup uh, is that in quantum physics, uh, an entity like an electron, say a photon, can sometimes behave like a wave, sometimes behave like a particle. The particular experimental setup decides which it's going to be. You can you could do a certain experiment and see the particle-like nature of the electron. Another experiment see the particle-like nature, uh, the wave-like nature of the electron. And Wheeler's insight was to see that the choice of shall it be a particle, shall it be a wave, can be left until long after the electron has has done its wave-like or particle-like uh, activity. Uh, and so it looks like retro causation. It looks like what we're doing today is stretching back into the past. Um, it's not, and that is true in a sense, but it's not that we can change the past by making choices of what to observe now. We're not changing the past, but we're constraining the nature of past that was. And that's a sort of a very convoluted way of, of getting to the following statement, which is that we might naively suppose that the present state of the world is connected to its state at the Big Bang by a, a, a particular historical pathway, and that it simply, that is the pathway. That pathway exists, that's what happened. Uh, but it's not true. In quantum physics, you have fuzziness and incomplete information about the world, and so there are many, many possible pathways that connect the Big Bang with our present state. And when we do an observation, a quantum observation, we reduce the number of possible pathways that could exist. And so in that sense, what we do today affects the nature of reality as it was in the past. It doesn't change the past, can't send signals back to the past, but it does have an effect on what we can say about the past. And so in that somewhat abstract sense, uh, observers today are still relevant to the quantum physics of the Big Bang.